Hello, my name is Bernard Navarsky, and with my sister Sophie Brampton, I'm going to tell the story of my father's World War II experiences. My name is Sophie Brampton, and my father was Stanislaw Robert Wrosok Navarsky, who was a flight lieutenant in the Polish Air Force squadrons under the Royal Air Force Command in World War II. This is particularly pertinent this week, as on Friday the 8th of May 2020, it will be 75 years since Victory in Europe Day, otherwise known as VE Day, which marked the end of the Second World War. My father was born on the 10th of August 1921 to a middle-class family. His father was a lawyer and his mother was a teacher. He was the eldest child and he had a younger brother and younger sister. In the 1930s, he was a schoolboy. He had a bicycle to go to school in summer and a pair of skis to go to school in winter. He excelled academically and enjoyed his sports. He loved ski jumping and high diving. He was also an accomplished glider pilot. This was a national sport in Poland in those times. He was, in fact, gliding in the summer of 1939. In those days, the glider was launched off a hill by a winch. It's an aircraft with no engine. And so the skill lies in trying to find thermals under the clouds to keep airborne. At the age of just 17, my dad could fly a glider for up to five hours at a time. He described the latter part of 1938 and the spring and summer of 1939 as an uneasy period. The Poles sensed that something was brewing up. Europe was in turmoil. Hitler's Germany annexed Austria, occupied Sudetenland, and then Czechoslovakia fell. Hitler then turned his attention to Poland by reopening the question of the corridor to East Prussia. Border incidents were staged and it became obvious that Poland was to be the next victim. That seemed to have decided for the West that a stand had to be made somewhere. England and France guaranteed Poland's frontiers, thus virtually ensuring war if Germany invaded Poland. In mid-August 1939, Dad came back from his gliding holiday and signed on as a fresher at Krakow University to read medicine. His father, was a colonel in the Polish Army Reserve and was called up for active duties and manoeuvres at the beginning of August. And the war started on the 1st of September 1939 at four o'clock in the morning. German panzer divisions crossed the Polish frontier at several points. They were confronted by Polish cavalry. Unfortunately, the Poles were no match for Hitler's army. The Luftwaffe started bombing Warsaw and other cities. Lectures at the university were suspended, and so my father joined his father's regiment as a private. The situation was chaotic. Nobody knew what was happening and how the war was progressing. Radio bulletins were full of accounts of battles, mostly won by the Poles. But they were merely trying to keep up the morale of the Polish people. The battles had not been won uh, and they were having to surrender. The Germans continued to advance deeper and deeper into Poland. His father's regiment was constantly retreating to take up new positions. Eventually, they arrived at the ancient city of Lwów. At this point, the German pursuit had stopped. They did not attack the city, which was now full of Polish soldiers. However, there were two two Russian divisions at the eastern gates of Lvov, so they were surrounded. Germans to the west, Russians to the east. They were given the choice of surrendering to either. The garrison command chose to surrender to the Russians. They gave up their rifles. Non-commissioned officers and other ranks were released and told to go home. All officers were detained. My father swapped his private's greatcoat for that of a second lieutenant, so as not to be separated from his father. There were about 600 officers. They were all marched to a railway station and boarded castle transport trains. The coaches were very uncomfortable. Each wagon had four long benches on which to sit, and there was no lavatory, only a hole in one corner of the carriage. The train left the following morning after more of the hierarchy from the city had been ordered to board the trains. The guards were very few in numbers and seemed very friendly. They were given loaves of bread and pork fat to eat. The train was slowly moving east. My father tried to persuade his father that they must get out and escape before they got too deep into Russia. His father was reluctant to leave his regiment. However, he was persuaded and on the second night, they got off the train. The train had stopped in the middle of nowhere for the locomotive to replenish its water. Just as the train was about to leave, my dad and his father lowered themselves through that corner hole and lay still between the rails. The train started up and then left the station, passing over them as they lay very still on the tracks. They waited until the train was well out of sight and the station became very quiet and dark. Then they got up and jumped into the bushes to hide. When it was deadly quiet, they started to walk back the way they had come. They had taken three loaves of bread 
and some fat with them. They kept the railway line just in sight. They walked at night and slept in the day. The countryside was very, very sparsely populated. They rationed the bread carefully. There was plenty of water in the streams to drink. On the 12th night, they came across a sign. It said Kotiri. They were back in Poland, hungry, tired and very, very dirty. They realised that they knew one of his father's office friends from this town. They found the house and knocked on the door. He gave them a hot meal and a hot bath and he also gave them civilian clothes. From Kotin, they made their way back to Lvov by train. Back in Lvov, they found lodgings and took stock of their situation. My father met three of his school friends. His father went back home to the family farm and spent most of the war in hiding. My father did not know it at the time, but he was not to see his father again for 20 years. They were four young Polish men eager to leave Poland and fight for their country. First, they had to get to Romania. The frontier was about 200 kilometers south of Lvov. They went to the Romanian consulate and bought entry visas for Romania. They arrived in a border town and booked into a guest house. Suddenly, they were confronted by a local militiaman who appeared with a rifle slung over his shoulder. My father thought quickly and pretended that he had a revolver in the pocket of his coat and pointed this pretend revolver at the militiaman. The militiaman didn't know what else to do. He was outnumbered and there was no support around. My father told him to go out into the streets, walk away and not look back. The next day they met their guide and set off for the frontier. A small river marked the frontier at their crossing point. It was only about waist deep and perhaps 30 meters wide. The area was lightly wooded. They walked briskly through the no man's land and reached their crossing point. They paid their guide and they waded across. My father said the water was icy cold it was now the beginning of November. They reached the other side. They were in Romania, very wet and exhausted, but also elated that they had made it and still very much alive. They kept the rising sun to their left and walked in a southerly direction, deeper and deeper into Romania. After about three hours, they met a Romanian border guard. He was dressed in a very smart uniform with a few medals dangling on his chest and he was on a lovely white horse. He beckoned them to follow him to a nearby village and they eventually arrived at the local police station. They had their particular taken and they were told they would be taken to Kamauti, a nearby town. They wanted to go to Samauti because they knew there was a Polish consulate there. They were transported there in a horse and cart. In Samauti, they were told that they would have to attend a court hearing and the charge would be illegal entry into Romania. The hearing would take place in about 10 days time. In the meantime, they were detained in the police station prison cells. Detained in the police station, my father noticed that the lavatory window looked out onto the high streets. It was only about waist high above the pavement. In order to get through that window my father picked away at the bricks surrounding it. He did this during the night when the station was quiet. Early in the morning on the third day after removing the bars they clambered out into the streets and made for the Polish consulate. The consul eventually arrived and was not at all surprised to see them. Obviously they were not the first fugitives to arrive at his doorstep. He explained the procedures to them. They were issued with identity papers and were given money to buy railway tickets to Bucharest. They left Canalti that afternoon. They reported to the Polish embassy in Bucharest. They were provided with accommodation and some money for food. It took them about two weeks to organize their identity papers and railway tickets to France. The train took them through Yugoslavia and Italy. Italy was not yet at war. This was now the end of November 1939. My father said that these were momentous days in his life. So much had happened in just three months. At the beginning, he was a student in Krakow University. Then the war started and his country was no more. And then he was a prisoner of war and escaped. And then another escape from a Russian occupied Poland to Romania. And after a train journey, Across Europe, he found himself in France. He was still just 18 years old. When he arrived in France, he volunteered to join the Air Force and was sent to a gathering centre in Lyon. There were a number of Poles there already by this time. He was classified as an élève pilot and given the rank of soldier at second class. He said there was no lower rank in the French Air Force. The pay was 50 centimes and 10 cigarettes per day. The food was good. They were issued with eating utensils and half a litre mug for coffee at breakfast time and wine with late lunch. As elev pilots, they had lectures in aviation aspects, navigation, airmanship, and of course, 
French. They also had to do ordinary sentry duties. He spent Christmas 1939 at Lyon Brant Aerodrome and was on sentry duty on Christmas Day. That was his first Christmas away from his family. Incidentally, at that time, he had a premonition. On the night of May the 7th, 1940, he dreamt that he was sitting on a latrine when he saw a German bomber approaching, flying quite low and heading straight for him with its bomb doors wide open. A bomb detached itself from the plane and was about to hit when suddenly he woke up. Three days later, on the 10th of May, 1940, at five o'clock in the morning, he was indeed sitting on that very same latrine, still half asleep, when he suddenly remembered his dream and smartly ran back into the barracks and woke everybody up and told them to escape. They all scampered into the nearest anti-aircraft ditch. Several bombers dropped bombs on the aerodrome and strafed the buildings with machine gun fire. When it was all over and the all clear sounded, the latrines were no more, just one big crater. This incident is actually documented in the official French Air Force history of the Second World War, where it says that the latrines at Lyon Brun were the only casualty of that air raid. The war in France did not last long. All of northern France and Paris was occupied by Germans, and it would only be a matter of days before the rest of France fell. The squadron was disbanded. With his squadron members, they flew from Lyon Brun to Marseille where they tried to refuel. They were unable to so they went on foot to Port Vendre on the Mediterranean coast from where they took a boat to Oran in northern Africa. The British consul there organized a train journey to Casablanca in Morocco and then on to Gibraltar. This was now the end of June 1940. In Gibraltar they were put on a large ship that eventually became part of a large convoy that would take them to England. They were on a boat for 16 days and eventually docked in Liverpool on the 13th of July 1940. After disembarking, they were marched to Liverpool Exchange Station. A train was ready and waiting for them, and they were given a numbered seat. They were also given sandwiches and a mug of tea. They were taken to Innsworth Lane near Gloucester. On arrival, they were bussed to the RAF station and allocated a bed in a Nissan hut. They were issued with a mattress and blankets. The next day, they were all kitted out with uniforms. After interrogation and verification of their stories, my dad was given the rank of aircraft man second class. At that time it carried a salary of two shillings per day and it was backdated to their arrival in Gibraltar. He was rich at last. They were all posted to Blackpool. None of them could speak a word of English but they were very eager to learn. English was force fed to them from nine to five every day. He spent about five weeks in Blackpool and had several dual flights on Tiger Moths before progressing to fairy battles and then on to hurricanes. He was promoted to the rank of sergeant. He said the hurricane was a lovely aircraft to fly. Very friendly and forgiving. On the 10th of September 1940 he was posted with two other pilots to 303 Squadron and stationed at Northolt. During this time the famous Battle of Britain was still going strong. It had started in July 1940 and it ended on the 15th of September 1940. In just 42 days, 303 Squadron shot down 126 German planes, becoming the most successful fighter command unit in the Battle of Britain. Nine of the squadron's pilots qualified as aces for shooting down five or more enemy planes, including Sergeant Joseph Francek, who was a Czech flying with the Poles and he scored 17 down planes. Overall, the squadron scored nearly three times the number of kills of the average British fighter squadron, with only a third of the casualty rate. At just 19 years old, he was the youngest pilot in 303 squadron, with barely a few hours on hurricanes. He didn't last very long. On his second local flight, he was to deliver a hurricane from Heston to North Weald. He managed to get himself shot down. He barely landed in a field, and the plane came to a full stop after hitting a rather a solid hedge. He bashed his face on the instrument panel and was knocked out. He also broke his right arm. Luckily, the plane did not catch fire. When he woke up in hospital with his face repaired but totally bandaged, he thought he was blind. He could also not move his arm because it was in a plaster cast. He had no recollection of that flight and did not know why he was in hospital. He was told that he was taken out of a wrecked hurricane, unconscious with facial injuries and broken right arm. He was told that he was not blind, his left eye was certainly all right and his right eye would recover. When they removed the bandages, he was elated that he could see out of both eyes. He was in hospital for two months months and then sent to Blackpool to convalesce. He had a medical examination and was pronounced fit for flying duties. He was posted to an operational training unit in Grangemouth 
in Falkirk, Scotland. After finishing a course there, he was posted to 302 Squadron in Northolt in May 1941. He was operational until the end of November, a full six months. 302 Squadron was mainly engaged in fighter sweeps over northern France and Holland. They also acted as bomber escorts. They were very busy and lost several pilots. During this time he managed to complete the operational tour which consisted of 55 sorties. A sortie was the term used for an operational flight. The average number of sorties that a Spitfire pilot would complete was about 12. My father completed 178 during the war, well above average. From the information we've gathered there were four types of missions that a Spitfire pilot would carry out when on duty for their squadron. There were bomber escorts. The Spitfire squadron would fly in formation at different heights to the bomber, each pilot with a mandate to patrol a particular area of sky in their sight. If they saw enemy aircraft, then they would attack them to stop them destroying our bomber planes, the Lancaster. This was known as a dogfight. A dogfight depended on the skill of the pilot to win it. They were over in a flash and my dad said he didn't have time to be scared. He was always relieved to be alive afterwards. On all the bomber escort missions my dad did, he never lost a bomber and he was always successful in dogfights. Incidentally, whenever a Spitfire started to fire its guns, the footage was recorded and analysed when they returned so they could see what was hit. When they had to accompany the Lancasters, which were slower than the Spitfires, my father said they had to weave their way around to keep their speed down. At this time, the Spitfires could fly at a top speed of about 350 miles an hour, and the Lancasters' top speed was 280. When carrying out a bomber escort, they generally flew at high altitudes of around 12,000 feet. They flew above and below the bombers in formation, patrolling and protecting them. Another type of sortie were the fighter sweeps. These were very different to bomber patrols. Their mission was to fly to northern France and to shoot at and destroy enemy installations where they were making weapons. When they got there, they were met with heavy oppositional fire from the ground. They left RAF Northolt and flew at low level over the English Channel, literally at a height of 10 to 20 metres over the channel. They flew fast at a top speed of around 350 miles an hour. Imagine trying to identify landmarks to then know which installations you were trying to attack. And my father said everything was a blur. However, when they got there, they were met with heavy fire from the ground. This was difficult. There was no dependence on skill. It was just luck. If the enemy fire managed to hit the plane's petrol tank or the cooling system, then it would only be a matter of time before it burst into flames. Then there were channel patrols. The fighter squadrons would be in charge of patrolling the English Channel and looking after the naval ships patrolling there. Later on in the war, in 1944, my father and his squadrons were involved in the dive bombing of the enemy installations. This was a courageous feat, flying at around 8,000 feet and then making a vertical dive at their target to around 500 feet, firing at it against enemy fire. So, as previously mentioned, my father completed 55 sorties during active service in 302. In November 1941, he was sent back to 58 operational training units, but this time as an instructor. He would teach young, fresh, new fighter pilots formation flying, combat tactics, and generally how to survive to fight another day. In 1942, my dad was called up to 316 Squadron for another operational tour. The squadron was equipped with Spitfires 5B. These had clipped wings and he said that they were a delight to fly. To begin with, they were stationed in Yorkshire and engaged mainly in patrols. He said that was boring. Nothing ever much happened. Things changed, however, when the squadron was posted to Northolt. They acted as escorts to bombers. The targets were usually marshalling yards in Lille and Amiens and in the Pas de Calais area. Le Havre, Cherbourg and Rouen in Normandy. Port installations at Brest were particularly heavily defended and they always met fierce opposition there and sustained considerable losses. Towards the end of 1942, they met the new German fighter plane, the FW-190. It had an advantage over Spitfire 5s in speed and power, but the Spitfire was more agile and it could, in experienced hands, still outfly the FW. Only just though. Unfortunately, the squadron lost a number of their new pilots to the FW-190s. In August 1943, he was taken off operationals, having survived another lot of operational sorties. There had been 127 in total, and he was just 22 years old. He was posted to number 61 operational training unit at Monford Bridge and Hayenden 
in Cheshire, again to instruct, and he was there for six months. In February 1944, he was posted back to 302 Squadron at RAF Northolt. The squadron was equipped with Spitfire 9s. This was an aircraft that could hold its own with an FW-190. His duties were mainly bomber escorts. On many occasions, he also escorted American flying fortresses which attracted stiff opposition from enemy fighters. For the first time, they were being instructed in dive bombing techniques. The Germans were preparing V-1 installations for flying bombs, which were later nicknamed doodlebugs. So the targets consisted of launching ramps and underground storage facilities, and therefore presented very small targets. They were situated mostly in the Pas de Calais area. To render these targets useless, the ramp had to receive a virtually direct hit. They were always very well camouflaged, and heavily defended by anti-aircraft fire. After each dive bombing mission, the Spitfires came back covered in holes from the bullets fired at them. They were inspected by the ground crew who repaired them meticulously, ready for the next pilot and the next sortie. My father said they did not like the dive bombing attacks because survival depended entirely on luck and the skill of the pilot did not really come into it. However, he was a senior ranked pilot by this time and often led the squadrons from RAF Northolt to Northern France to destroy the enemy installations. D-Day arrived. This was 75 years ago last year. My father was still operational in 302 Squadron. On the 6th of June, they were briefed at about three o'clock in the morning. The invasion was on. They were to patrol the Neptune beach where the British and Canadian forces would land in their boats. They took off around 4.20 a.m. The visibility was good, but the cloud base was only at about 2,000 feet and there was total cloud cover. My father described the sight of the landing crafts from the air as absolutely incredible. There was an armada of ships and landing craft of all shapes and sizes moving slowly towards France. There were so many of them, so densely packed together that he said it seemed that you could almost walk across to France. His actual words were read out at the 75th anniversary of the D-Day landings at Bayeux Cemetery in Normandy. My dad spent two hours patrolling over the beaches and observed the troops disembarking from their landing crafts and making for the shore. By the time they turned back for England, the returning ships and landing crafts were already a fair way up the channel on their return journey. He flew again later that day on a second sortie and the sight was the same. A ribbon of ships sailing to France and another ribbon sailing back. On the 7th and 8th of June, the squadron again flew twice each day, patrolling the Neptune beach. On the 9th of June, the weather closed in and flying was impossible. On the 10th of June, he again flew two sorties. They were the first squadrons to land in France in a place called Plumelot in Normandy. A landing strip was prepared where they could land and refuel without having to fly all the way back to England. They were elated. Exactly four years after they had to leave, they were back on French soil again, and this time as welcome liberators. After another three weeks, the squadron actually used that airstrip as a more permanent base. They lived in tents. My dad told me that they were instructed to dig a six foot trench in which to sleep in inside their tents, and this was to stop them being fired at from the enemy. However, at this time there was virtually no opposition from the air. The only casualties were from ground fire. Very often they came back with holes in their aircraft that they didn't even know that they had acquired until they had inspected their aircrafts after landing. They were still very much engaged in dive bombing the V1 installations and also in bomber escorts. It was a very busy time. On the 9th of August he attacked barges carrying retreating German troops across the River Seine. Despite strong opposition, 12 direct hits were obtained, causing major fires. And on the return flight, he also attacked an enemy U-boat near Le Havre and set it on fire. Three days later, he led his section against enemy transports and attacked and destroyed a lorry packed with troops. Early in October, he attacked a train with cannon and machine gun fire. Despite heavy anti-aircraft fire, his attack was accurate and the train exploded. The squadron advanced into Belgium. Canal traffic in the Netherlands was also attacked at this point. On October the 5th, he led a squadron against a concentration of barges near Rotterdam. Eight were hit and destroyed. The intensity of operations continued throughout the month. My father continued to lead the squadron. He attacked a train approaching a bridge. 10 direct hits with bombs were recorded and the train was destroyed. Three days later, he attacked another train near Leiden and the steam engine exploded and five carriages were set on fire. On the 29th of October, my father dive-bombed 
a concentration of enemy troops. It was his 178th and final wartime sortie. In his recommendation for his distinguished flying cross, he was described as an extremely good pilot and a very efficient leader and very courageous. The war finished on a sad note for my dad. His best friend was shot down over Lubeck by anti-aircraft fire on what turned out to be the squadron's last operational sortie. Peace broke out the very next day. To end my story, I would like to take you back to the very beginning when my father and his father escaped from the train that was taking them and his father's regiment to the prisoner of war camp in the Katyn forest in Russia. In 1959, 20 years after he said goodbye to his father and left Poland, he went back to see his family. His father showed him a book. It was not an ordinary book. All it contained were pages and pages and pages of names of around about 15,000 Polish officers that were executed under the order of Stalin in Katyn in May 1940. The names of every one of his father's friends that were on that train were in that book. He was lucky to be alive on so many counts. He was the kindest, most gentle and humblest person you could ever meet. He was also great fun and lived every day as if it were a bonus, which if you think about it, it was. He never really shared the details of his heroic times during the Second World War when I was your age. He did share it later on and has been involved in a number of TV documentaries, books uh, and his words are recorded in an oral history record at the Imperial War Museum. He also gave no numerous talks on his incredible journey. The words I've read to you today are from a combination of those records and depict a story of how a young Polish man fought for his country and for our independence. He fought for freedom and against all the odds, survived it and went on to carve a successful life out here in England. After the war, he was a test pilot for the RAF until he was demobbed in 1948 to go to university. He qualified as a dentist in 1952 and he worked until he was in his late 70s. He continued his love of gliding until well into his 80s, as well as skiing until he was 88. He played golf and bridge into his 90s. He died on the 8th of January 2017, aged 95, at home after a short illness. We were with him. At his funeral, there was a presence by RAF Northolt who played the last post. There was also a Spitfire fly past from RAF Duxford and the Polish president was represented by the Polish consul from the Polish embassy and he was posthumously awarded the Knight's Cross of the Order of Polonia Restituta.